All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jacob Gorenkoff, and I'm the Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives with the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I'm currently on in Ottawa is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people, and I thank them for allowing me to live, work, and play on this land. Hopefully, we're all now familiar with Zoom, uh, but to recap, because I had some technical difficulties already today, uh, today's webinar is in real time. You should now be able to see a title screen of today's presentation and be able to hear me by your computer speakers, headset, or through your phone if you've chosen to dial in. As we're in webinar format, you're all muted. If you wish to ask questions, you may type them in the Q&A section on the webinar control panel at any time during the presentation, and we'll, we will address as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. I'm sure we've all seen homeless encampments throughout our communities, increasingly so during the last few years. As professionals in the housing and homelessness sector, we know the proliferation of these encampments are a symptom of a lack of affordable permanent housing solutions. We need to handle these encampments effectively, and BC Housing has demonstrated success in doing so, including through the decampment process. Here to tell you about BC Housing's experience is Stephanie Allen, BC Housing's Vice President of Strategic Business Operations and Performance. Welcome, Stephanie. Over to you. Good morning, and thanks, Jacob. Thanks, uh, folks, for gathering. A uh, real pleasure to talk to you today about this really important topic. Uh, I'm joining today from the ancestral unceded um, homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I think it's really critical as we talk about homelessness in Canada to really recognize how First Peoples on these lands have been displaced and their overrepresentation. Um, unfortunately, in homeless populations across the country and right here on their own lands, um, which is really, uh, I think, a calling for all of us to act in strong solidarity uh, and committing ourselves to good relations. So, uh, you know, I just, you know, in my role at BC Housing, I, I've come into this work, um, you know, like many of you having worked in the sector, um, working in affordable housing, but never having really been immersed in the issues facing folks that are finding themselves unhoused for a number of reasons. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how BC Housing has approached this work, what myself and my, our colleagues have done to really ground our work in culturally informed and trauma-informed approach to homelessness and um, to bring ourselves in, you know, to a discussion really today on how we can do this work from that perspective. All right, I think I can advance the screen. Yes, there we go. So just a little bit about BC Housing. Um, BC Housing, for those who don't know, we um, are uh, really a do two kind of wear two hats in the province. We both directly deliver and manage housing to the tune of around or just over 5,000 units of housing. But most um, of our work happens by our support of the not for profit housing sector. Um, and that includes health, you know, uh, funding and supporting the not for profit housing sector to build, develop, and operate housing. And we do that through partnerships. Those partnerships occur with all levels of government, regional, municipal, federal provincial, and as well as community service organizations that have housing and the support of folks as their key mandate. Um, we have about 800 nonprofit housing providers in the province of BC, and each year we support either through direct housing or through rent supplements about 110,000 households um, in communities across BC every year. Now, this to ground ourselves in an understanding of what causes homelessness. I thought it was important that we kind of recognize that there's some pathways that impact people and some of them intersectingly uh, do impact folks. So first is the systemic um, factors and these terminologies have been switched around, but the first is really systemic. And those are things like poverty or intergenerational poverty, discrimination um, that excludes people with disabilities, racialized people, indigenous people, considered LGBTQ plus people um, and people who are migrants from accessing various aspects of our society, including the formal economy, um, but also housing. 
There's also the systemic issues um, facing uh, the lack of affordable housing in Canada. None of you on this call need to hear me talk about the failures of, you know, of, of, of keeping up with the demand for uh, affordable uh, housing. We're living in a time of extreme crisis, um, really, in housing. And then really to think about the impact of colonization, as I mentioned, on Indigenous peoples as a systemic driver of homelessness for their communities. And then also when we look at the individual side, we see people experiencing trauma through childhood, through various episodes, um, family violence and abuse um, that leaves people without homes, um, people who have, you know, even mild mental health issues that escalate and become more and more complicated and their ability to hold employment and housing impacting their ability to stay sheltered folks who are medicating and using substances to treat trauma and other impacts, um, oftentimes from the illicit drug trade, and then other physical and other health issues. We know disability is one of them that drives folks into poverty and also then those traumatic events ending up um, without housing. And then there's also the structural areas that, are, that cause people um, homeless, to find themselves homeless, barriers to accessing the public system. Um, you know, a lot of the folks that we work with have lost identification. Um, some of them have debts that are, you know, they're trying to flee from and they've never been able to get a handle on and there's no um, credit counseling or abilities for them to, to beat that, those, those um, concerns. There's also you know, uh, gaps in the transition planning of folks leaving foster care. Uh, many of us know uh, that 18 year olds or 19 year olds turning that age doesn't mean you're just independent on, on, on your own, meeting all your financial and, and life needs. And so that transition is another area of significant gap. And then there's the discharge planning from publicly funded institutions, corrections, hospitals. A lot of times people coming out having lost everything or having no, no family, no so, um, social uh, network and find themselves in, in homelessness. So many of these pathways that we're seeing to homelessness, with none of them do you see people that are you know, faulty, that they themselves are deficient, or there's problems with them as individuals um, not meeting some standard. I think, you know, we see the stigma that is created around homelessness. And unfortunately, we have a lot of work ahead of us to, to bring the stigma down and to really recognize that these are, these are failures that occur along many intersections in folks' lives that leave them without homeless, without homes. So just talking a little bit about our experience um, in the last few years through the pandemic, both addressing um, the homeless encampment in a place called Oppenheimer Park in Vancouver and another large park called Strathcona Park. The photo on the screen here shows tents um, and folks, you know, busy about their lives um, of survival um, of facing homelessness. You know, the pandemic um, kind of met us in a situation where we had already had a number of things going on um, that were causing a crisis and it really escalated um, the, the issues around homelessness as we saw right across the country. And so with some of the restrictions that came in place, we saw homeless populations and encampments grow. Some of those things came in place because, you know, appropriately so, um, housing providers wanting to maintain stricter adherence to public health orders, prevented guests and overnighting, um, which a lot of people do survive on for uh, couch surfing. A lot of people found themselves without jobs. Um, a number of, of other factors really exacerbated the encampments that, that we had in Vancouver and then subsequently in Strathcona. And, you know, our, our work really was centered on the work we did in advance. Um, and that was to really take the invitation that came to BC Housing in 2019 to sit down and to listen to folks that were experiencing homelessness, um, which is what we, we did. They said, you know, you've been doing this work, trying to move people indoors, you're missing parts of the equation here. So we attended those um, meetings and learned quite a lot about where the system was indeed not working for them, um, not working for the people that were finding themselves in these situations. Um, many of the factors that we described in the last screen as well. 
And then there was also the compounding issues of folks who, when they are on shelter for prolonged periods of time, their health deteriorates, their mental state and mental health deteriorate. So there's a number of factors that continue to come to play in, in addressing these situations. Now, um, interestingly enough about the locations, I'll give you for those of you who are not in Vancouver, don't know the landscape, Amenheimer Park and Strathcone, of course, both located on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh tooth First Nations. Oppenheimer Park is located in the downtown east side of Vancouver. It's one of the only parks and one of the only green spaces available to this very low income community. It's also the home of the former Japanese community before the World War II internment. It's got a rich history and a lot of texture to the folks that have found themselves in this area of town. Of course, lots of exclusion and discrimination in the way that Vancouver was founded. And so a lot of low income, racialized um, indigenous people um, live within this vicinity. Strathcona Park, on the other hand, is located in a more um, single family neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that is also an older part of Vancouver, also a formerly working class and racialized community. It was kind of the melting pot for racialized groups that were excluded from other more white areas of Vancouver, um, but has really changed. And, and of course, with housing values going up in Vancouver, that location um, is an area where there's, you know, affluent homeowners now, a lot of working professionals, and the park there is a multi-use, multi-purpose um, park for that community. So it was in 2020 that we did our work with Oppenheimer, and last year, this time, actually, that we were doing our moving efforts in Strathcona. And I'll talk a little bit about how those, how those um, events worked out and how we worked with folks. So like I mentioned, number one for us was really building relationships, not only BC Housing, but also our, our nonprofit partners that we were funding to really address and support folks. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in Vancouver who recognize and see the needs on the ground. They arrive, they show up with support meals, um, harm reduction supplies, other um, support services to folks that are in encampments. And, you know, it was really critical for us when we were invited to the Oppenheimer encampment by camp leaders to hear about what the issues were that they were facing and how our processes were not necessarily supporting them in their, in their work. I was the most senior person at BC Housing at the time to go down. And that was really just a matter of, I, I don't live very far away. And I really wanted to hear firsthand um, how the work was going for folks and how they felt things had gone, not met their needs in the past. And we issued an apology on behalf of BC Housing for some of the ways that these things were not meeting their needs. We heard very, very um, fraught stories of, of people feeling like when decampments happen, the wait list that we currently have, which we know is lengthy, people bypass the wait list system, some people get excluded from these efforts, um, and that this is actually causing still a lot of turmoil despite our, our good efforts. And so through that communication, ourselves and colleagues from the park board um, here in Vancouver were unique in that we have a level of government that is just governance over parks in Vancouver. This is a vestige of a colonial past um, when certain parks were set up in the um, exclusion and displacement of Indigenous folks, but they are their own elected officials that oversee parks, and so they have a little bit of nimbleness in also how they operate. And we were sitting at this um, in a tent together in the park, really learning and listening to the folks that were on the ground. Um, we were yelled at, we were called things that folks felt a lot of frustration at the system. And it really was our job to listen um, without defensiveness, without, you know, um, rec you know, without any kinds of um, counter uh, attacks or to go on any kinds of, um, you know, criticism of these folks, because we recognize the power imbalance in what we're doing. We are an authority. Uh, those of us that were there are there as a part of our jobs. Um, and the folks that were there were really there out of survival. So it was really critical for us to leave defensiveness aside and to take the brunt of, of what they were expressing, which was important. 
Um, and we had a lot more listening to do than talking. Now, through the listening process that we had with folks on the ground, we came to learn about what I call a bit of an ecosystem that occurs in encampments. There are extreme um, feelings and, and dispositions towards mutual aid and folks helping each other out. That's not true of everyone. There are absolutely predators that are seeking to um, exploit and cause harm to people in these circumstances. We know that people have substance use in these circumstances, everything from alcohol and, and, and drinkers that we, uh, know, we know we have a drinker's lounge in Vancouver for folks who are low income to access um, less costly um, alcohol. But we also know that those substances go right up into you know, very um, hard substances that impact them in a very serious way. So the substance use also meant we needed harm reduction and the campers were providing a lot of that harm reduction. They even had a supervised consumption tent for the folks that were living in the in the in the um, encampments, both here and uh, this picture is from Oppenheimer and and in um, Strathcona, and there is this difference that we came to understand between survival suppliers of illicit substances, because let's be honest, people have addiction. If you've watched the the documentaries about big pharma's role in addictions, it's really alarming. We're dealing with the fallout of this to this day. But there are people that are, you know, providing substances to folks. They're also surviving in these circumstances. And there are predators. Um, and those are folks that use violent enforcement. They use violence in their collection um, responsibilities. And they're very, um, you know, it's, 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 they're part of organized crime networks. And there was a distinction that we saw with camp leaders trying to um, support people's survival and trying to keep predatory elements at bay. And I really wanna name someone uh, at this time, Chrissy Brett. Chrissy Brett is an indigenous woman. She was part of the 60s scoop. Um, her mother was a very young girl when she was born. She was removed from uh, her parents um, and put into foster care and, and struggled. And I share a little bit about her story because she is a fierce advocate for people in encampments. She's been doing this advocacy for years. Um, many people consider her a bit of a thorn in their side because of the way that she does leverage and harness the issues that are going and taking place in encampments. But we found her to be someone that was really critical to the success of our work and working collaboratively with her, understanding what she was trying to do to keep people alive really um, allowed us to work um, more efficiently together, more effectively together and build that mutual respect and trust that I think is really critical when you talk about doing this work in a culturally and trauma informed way. When it came time um, for us to develop moving plans, um, after building relationships over several months, the pandemic hit. We started our relationships in the fall of 2019. The pandemic hit in early 2020. And then the camp size grew significantly through the spring as the weather warmed up. And so we knew that there was going to be an effort by the province to secure housing for folks and have them move indoors. And so when we were building a plan to move campers, we built this plan with them. We did not impose something on them and show up in ways because that also increases anxiety, that increases trauma, people become very reactive. We didn't want any of that kind of thing to impede what was this work to move people indoors. We worked with partner agencies across the spectrum in the planning of this work. Health authorities, the city of Vancouver, the Parks Board, of course, the Ministry for Children and Families, um, folks that are uh, you know, connected in with corrections, the Vancouver Police Department, the Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services, all of them had this role during the Oppenheimer planning stage. And we were setting our intentions very early, which was we want to move people without the use of enforcement. It's been clearly communicated to us how traumatic that has been, particularly for Indigenous people who have faced so much intergenerational and personal trauma at the hands of law enforcement, and that we wanted to do this in a way that really respected people's needs. 
The other reason we wanted to do it this way is because it boosted the success when they would move in and the settlement into their into their housing spaces. And so this was really a, a critical way for us to work together was to evolve our best practices. We were pivoting and changing as we go. On the operational side of things, I mean, we were having meetings twice a day, once at around eight in the morning and again at 6 p.m. And that was seven days a week um, going into this effort. It is a lot of work that takes to coordinate this. It's not you know, take out a sheet and just run through a checklist. It was critical for us to really make sure that we were building this practice as we were building the relationships with campers. Another critical aspect of this that I, I really want to lift up is that we wanted to work with peers, people with lived experience, and with Indigenous cultural knowledge keepers and wisdom keepers. We um, set to inviting the First Nations, um, the local First Nations representatives from Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil to conduct ceremony every morning of our moving efforts. And, and that is what we did. And we had elders that showed up. They spoke words over the work every morning um, as just before we delivered breakfast to the campers. And they their words had a very healing and calming effect on the work we were doing. Um, it was, I, I can't tell you how moving, how um, uh, supportive and how calming it was to have um, First Nations um, on whose lands we were standing on teach us about the land we were on, what part of their territory they had as their history here, the ways that the trees had specific distinctions. Like we were really benefited from having that kind of support um, from First Nations. We also um, made sure that we provided folks with breakfast. Um, it was another way of, of, of saying we're working together. We want to bring, you know, a type of a friendlier um, kind of role to this work. Um, and the tone and, and, and the way that we worked with peers, we paid peers stipends to help people with packing, helping people with navigating the systems. Those are people that had lived experiences of homelessness and could really support what we were doing. Um, the other part of this is the daily communications um, that we issued. You'll see here um, representatives from um, the local First Nations um, that were giving ceremony on our screen. And then we also recognize that even though we had a, an office, uh, sorry, an, uh, um, an, um, an order to vacate issued by public safety, we know that the posting of that um, order was not really accessible to people living in the camp. It's legal jargon. It's um, not necessarily accessible reading levels for folks. So we prepared daily communications for the campers in their places um, so that they could see, you know, and with breakfast, we delivered these flyers every morning. So people had information. And as we learned new barriers, for example, bike storage, a lot of people had bikes. If they were moving indoors, what was going to happen with their belongings? Could they store them? Was there on-site storage? Um, and so those were the kinds of answers that we had to, to provide. You'll notice on the screen, we also talk about hotels. Um, BC Housing was one of the largest buyers of hotels in the country um, in 2020 in Q, uh, Q3, uh, the fiscal Q, Q2, I should say. Because, and we bought those hotels um, because we were looking at these opportunities to move people indoors and recognizing that we didn't have places for them to go. I, I can't say um, enough about what it was to have housing offers that were not just a mat on a floor. Um, because many of the people that we had been working with and serving had cycled in and out of homelessness and they themselves um, having lots of traumatic experiences in the shelter system. So it was important as we did the sweet preparation and the placement preparation through working with people, getting to know their needs, getting to understand their needs and having the variety of housing options available. I'll give an example of one person that, you know, we, we, we had an individual in Oppenheimer who was a known fire starter you know, which poses a safety risk for the people that they're gonna live with. So when we were giving and preparing a housing offer for that individual, we wanted to prepare a housing officer that was accessible to them, but also you know, made sure that there was safety for other residents. Another individual who was 
what we call a treasure hunter. Um, many people use the term hoarding, which we don't use because it's stigma reinforcing, but had a lot of belongings. Our case management approach to working with that individual was to work with them patiently over time to become accustomed to the idea of moving indoors. And then we had a space for them that was specifically arranged by our community nonprofit partner, um, PHS Community Services, for them to move into where they really do support people that have, you know, a bit of a treasure hunting, treasure keeping um, behavioral patterns. So you can see how we had to continue to work on a person to person level um, and that these kinds of communications were critical to our success. I want to say something about the role of advocates and the role of protests. We've seen this happen across the country um, to some very, um, I think, unfortunate outcomes um, that have impacted people who do want to really step up and advocate on behalf of their neighbors that are homeless. You know, it is a legitimate expression of marginalized people through history. Um, protest, peaceful protest, has led to incredible changes in our societies. Uh, many of them as a black woman, I owe to the civil rights movement and other freedom movements. So I recognize the role and we recognize the role of that and how important it is. So advocates and protest, we did not shy away from. We recognized their, their right to self-expression and that we wanted to listen and learn so that we could do a better job. Now that comes on the flip side that there are some people that do exploit people in these circumstances. Um, they do show up with a bit of a savior complex. Um, this is oftentimes grounded in racialized identities and people who want to save others. Um, and that can be just as detrimental because they're no longer working for the benefit of the people that they say they're wanting to serve. They're working to, you know, um, shine a spotlight on themselves and affirm something in themselves. And so it's very important to be vigilant about that and know the distinction between service and exploitation uh, that does come up. And the role of jurisdictional bodies to minimize that, I think, is really important because for us at BC Housing, what we wanted to do is see where those exploiters were working and try our best to support people outside of that um, situation and not strengthen these exploitative um, individuals who were not acting in the best interest of folks. You know, talking about safety and the role of fire and law enforcement, you know, going into this um, discussion in 2020 with um, the VPD was really important for us to work closely with them. We had a really great member that we collaborated with who understood that we didn't want triggering events, that we didn't want people experiencing homelessness and their members to have conflict. And we had a very great um, operational um, process working together. However, um, you know, that doesn't always happen in every jurisdiction. And I think it's incumbent on all of us doing this work to establish really good conversation networks with law enforcement, with fire enforcement. We want people to be safe. We want them to be free of predatory elements, um, but we also know the impact and the, and the trauma that comes when people are dealing with, with um, first responders. So it's critical for us to have, we did not have a uniform police presence at Oppenheimer. Strathcona was a bit different in 2021. We came off the Black Lives Matter movement. We came off of some very tense um, pressures in communities. We had a different community. This was not the downtown east side. This was a single family residential area. And we saw a different, a bit of a different approach from the way that law enforcement responded, but I think still really working through our city partners and our part partners to maintain a collaborative effort and to keep the tensions down. Um, there were park rangers also on site. And as a result of this work, the parks board has hired unfortunately away from us, a really great resource um, to, to who is now their director of urban relationships, a woman by the name of Betty Leps, who led a lot of this work because they see the role in training the Rangers and advancing their um, equity lens, their trauma-informed practice in responding to people who are homeless in parks, which I think is a fantastic development that, is, that has been made. So in Oppenheimer, we had no arrests made um, out of a result of protest or anybody um, resisting leaving the park. And the same for Strathcona. 
There were some predators. There were some incidents that did require police removal of individuals. Those happened without too much incident. In Strathcona, there was a very large fire that took a tent down um, in flames. It was quite a traumatic event. Um, and we also had in the Strathcona encampment last year, a number of young Indigenous advocates who stayed on site. So we had a little bit different tension the next year, um, but I would say to all the agencies that were involved that we had a good collaborative approach and things happened without real incident. There were even times we had to ask the Indigenous youth, you know, we saw tensions rising between them and police and we knew that our work was focused on housing people and we respectfully asked them if they would consider giving it a little bit more space so that we could do our work, but also respecting their rights to, to remain there. You know, the other thing that I think is really important to lift up are the folks that were doing this work. We had representatives from Carnegie Center, which is a homeless support services and outreach group. We had um, the uh, PHS Community Services Society, um, representatives from Atira, and the ways that we moved people indoors really took a one-to-one -one relationship kind of an approach. Um, referrals to housing were discussed at a coordinated access table. We had didn't have a lot of time to do thorough interviews. We wanted to make sure we were screening for predators, and that's why the on-the-ground relationships between the outreach workers and what was going on in the encampment and camp leadership was critical to identifying those folks. They didn't receive hotel offers. They received shelter offers, which we knew they wouldn't take because they weren't necessarily homeless themselves. They were really there to prey on the people that were in camp there. So it was really through this kind of case management approach that we have really built our, our early capacities around trauma-informed practices. And we looked at other ways to mitigate and help support people moving indoors sex successfully. So there were family cohorts. You know, um, family sometimes are people you're related to and sometimes they're the folks you choose. And so there were folks that were in cohorts that um, wanted to move in together, that would be build, keeping their social networks in place, their support networks in place. We also talked about folks' current medical status. We had health um, authority teams there helping us with COVID protocols and COVID screening, both um, in 2020 and 2021. And then we had a range of housing options for people to move into. Um, for people that had lower barriers and lower um, complexities, we had directly managed housing that they could move immediately into and just needed furnishings. For folks that had higher needs, it was more going into supportive environments where there was you know, 24 seven support and, and harm reduction and other items in place. And, you know, we also wanted to make sure that because there was such a heavy Indigenous presentation in the population that we had culturally informed work when people moved indoors. You'll see on the left a welcome package um, for the Indigenous campers that arrived that included a blanket, toiletries, uh, and that was provided by Luma Native Housing Society, which was one of the operators of one of the hotel spaces that we secured for people moving indoors and where we prioritized people of Indigenous uh, background. So really it was about understanding and building the kind of infrastructure in place to make this successful and to make sure that people were moving indoors the best they could. Was this perfect? No, this was not. Were people you know, singing a tune? No, they were not. Um, some were very happy to be moving indoors. Others, very, very traumatized by a system, dealing with their own mental health issues. And, and it was definitely not the easiest a, a thing for everyone. It still creates a lot of anxiety for folks. And so all the steps we took were about minimizing that anxiety, knowing that we couldn't fully eliminate it for everyone. The other part I think that we want to kind of zone in on is cultural competency in the moving process in the housing operations. As I mentioned, we had Luma Native Housing, Atira organization, um, PHS. You know, it was really really important for people to maintain this connection to culture. Um, you know, there's an organization here in Vancouver called Culture Saves Lives. I think that is a true statement for a lot of the community groups that we are seeing presented in homelessness. That includes 
Indigenous people, but it also includes Black people. Black people are overrepresented in the homeless population in Metro Vancouver. So are people of Arab background and Latinx background. And so having the ability to look at the service providers, which we have done in subsequent time since these moving efforts to provide additional wraparound supports. Um, we have recently funded the Muslim Food Bank. We funded um, a, a group called All Nations Outreach Services who represent First Nations connections to people's homes, communities to help them with that journey should they want it, but also with cultural practice um, and healing um, um, methods and, and support actions. Um, we've taken on and supported Black groups, uh, Black nonprofit groups who can provide cultural support. So we're recognizing the need for people to have this kind of connection to community, especially where it does support and bolster their lives. It also means having the right accessibility items for people with disabilities, safe housing for people who are trans and gender diverse or two-spirit. Like all of those factors have to continue to undergird and be the lens we, um, we apply to all of our efforts. You know, the health and uh, supports and safe supply is, um, you know, this is a big topic um, because a lot of the folks that are living in encampments, they don't have a general health care practitioner that they're attached to. Hey, some of us who have, you know, jobs can't find, a, a, you know, a, a family doctor and, and who are living and, and, you know, able to access this and, and living in one place. But folks who are homeless, who are moving about a lot, they absolutely have a, it's a harder time and the health authorities are not, don't have necessarily the infrastructure to stay attached to folks. Um, so it was really important that we brought and, and worked closely with our health authority partners on this work because we knew health supports were critical every step of this journey. Um, we also wanted to bring in supports right to the encampment. So we had um, sanitary facilities added, washrooms and, and showers were brought on site in the um, Strathcona encampment experience in 2020. We had a warming tent because people were there through the winter and using, you know, very unsafe heating practices in their tents, which we know can cause death, um, a very tragic death for people who are homeless. So we were trying again to buffer the impacts of people being encamped before they moved into doors, recognizing that these are people that deserve dignity and safety as much as anyone else. So those kinds of interventions could be considered controversial. I think sometimes they were regarded as trying to entrench an encampment, but what we were really trying to do is alleviate the life safety risks that people were facing in the health crisis. We also had a pilot through the um, 2020 moving efforts of safe supply. It was not offered to everyone and it was not um, a, a program that has been widely implemented, but we saw a lot of positive impact of being able to offer people safe supply and remove the criminal, uh, criminal and predatory element of, of illicit substance supply to people in encampments and who are homeless. And I can't say enough how important that is, that we continue to see a move to complete decriminalization, um, safe supply, really trying to, trying to face this, this crisis that has been called an overdose crisis as a poison drug supply trauma treatment crisis. This is a health crisis. And we've really, and at least for myself, have come to really appreciate that in the work that we've done. And then just thinking about some of the other details and some of the other kind of um, things that can be either barriers or alleviate the pressure and anxiety for pe people moving indoors, such as pets, bikes, and storage. They're very important things. They're their belongings. Um, pets are family members. Um, goodness knows you heard my dog barking just now. He's mine. And so, you know, we, we have to think about how folks really do like lean on and need their belongings, just as important as our belongings in our homes. And so the outreach teams really um, worked closely with the campers. They raised the issue with us. We hadn't contemplated bike storage, but then as we were doing this work, we implemented bike storage at all the housing opportunities that people were moving into that didn't have something in place. And particularly the hotels that we bought because hotels don't typically have um, bike storage facilities. And so 
we also knew, knew that was important. Another aspect of this is about accommodating pets. Um, people who have pets um, will not move inside if they can't bring their pets with them. So we had a very low barrier uh, pet policy. And then we discovered in Strathcona something, you know, even more important. And that is that the care, upkeep, health of pets is compromised when people's care upkeep and their own health is compromised. Um, animals can become vicious. There was a terrible incident of an outreach worker getting bitten by a dog that had been let out of someone's camper. Um, the dog was not See, you know, a frightened dog, a dog that's usually confined, unfortunately, for too long a periods of time. And what we did was partner with the SPCA to bring in training for both the outreach teams that were going to be working on site, how to deal with aggressive pets. And then also for the individual who owned this dog, because the dog, of course, was taken into, um, you know, holding until there was a review of the incident. What this has then spawned for us is a funding partnership now with the SPCA, where we hope to work with people, with nonprofit partners, to really bring and implement increased supports for people with pets, because this is such a critical aspect of their housing. Many of these pets are being um, kept indoors, they're not getting exercise, they're not getting appropriate care, and we really want to start alleviating, alleviating both the suffering to the animals and the pet owners, and making sure that pet ownership is a happy experience for everyone and not a barrier to people and their and their successful housing. That's it for me. I'm sure there's lots more to talk about since this is about two years worth of work summed up in a in a 40 minute discussion. I'm happy to take folks questions. Thanks so much, Stephanie. That was a fantastic presentation. I know I definitely learned a lot and I'm sure everybody in the audience did too. So on that note, like Stephanie said, uh, we're now going to be opening the floor to any comments or questions. So please type them in the Q&A box on the webinar control panel if you haven't already, which nobody has. So while we wait, I'll kick us off. Um, sure. Stephanie, you mentioned that COVID has escalated a lot of the issues faced by homeless populations, including uh, related to health. Can you speak a little bit more uh, to your experience with the relationship between homelessness and health in light of the pandemic? Yeah, it's, a, it's an enormous topic, of course, um, but a few things I think went really well in Vancouver, and I think there's some opportunities to continue. Number one, I think the, the, the health folks that work in this community are very aware of the issues that the community faces. Um, and even if all the infrastructure is not fully in place yet, I think they understood the importance of safe protocols. And when the vaccine was available, they rolled out very low barrier, immediate vaccination clinics in this community to try and get as many people vaccinated as possible. It recognized that people are living in congregate settings, people are living in SROs where they share bathrooms. Um, these are not ideal living circumstances. None of us are trying to live in an SRO, right? So we recognize that the, the contagion and the, and the issues with, around COVID would be particularly exacerbated and the health authorities really did get to work in, in a very, very great way. We set up weekly calls with uh, senior folks at the city of Vancouver and the health authority to address the concerns we were seeing and how to resolve them jointly. And then the other things that have definitely bubbled to the surface are the discussions around safe supply, are the discussions around increased mental health supports. As a result of these collaborations, our health colleagues applied for and received funding to boost their outreach team. Their outreach teams were just critical success factors for us in our work um, of dealing with and supporting folks in these circumstances. Um, you know, so they 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 were very much on there on the ground to provide mental health. Um, you know, uh, counseling services. There were some very tense moments um, where there was uh, people that were one individual in particular that was threatening to light their tent on fire with themselves in it. They didn't want to leave. And it was really the, um, you know, outreach team uh, from the health from the health from the health clinic that talked this person through their mental health crisis, got them to relinquish their gasoline canisters, which there were a substantial number that we did remove. Um, and I myself was in there lifting some of them out. But it was one of those situations where we really saw the benefit of this collaboration. And then the, in the kind of broader policy ways that this has kind of been enacted in BC, we now have this funding that has come from the province to the health authorities across the province 
for what is being described as complex care housing. So increased health supports that are going to people where they live in supportive housing, SROs, wherever, to really help them with navigation, supports, health connections. And while this is the first year of this program, everyone's really excited about where this is going to go. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so Rick, somewhat related to that, uh, you've been mentioning that you have experience being at these encampments in person. I'm wondering, uh, is there an anecdote from those experiences that you haven't mentioned yet that you feel the audience would benefit from hearing? Oh, there's a lot um, that really came out of this work. And, and, I, and I think that I'll think about it as I'm kind of describing, you know, the, the folks on the ground that do outreach work are, are very skilled at what they do. Um, they understand the impacts of folks. They understand what's going on. And maybe it's a great place to lift up the trauma that they themselves experience. I think we have to recognize that this is not just a system that's harming homeless people. It's harming the people that care about them. Um, there was an incident on the very first day of our moving efforts. So we showed up the first day, we had the Indigenous ceremony. Um, it was a very great way to start the morning. And as the outreach workers were going tent to tent to start, you know, delivering breakfast and flyers and letting folks know about the moving program, one of our outreach workers discovered a woman that had been severely beaten and, and, and very, very um, hurt. Um, she ended up having to go into um, hospital for her injuries. Um, there was a um, identification of who did the, the abuse, who did violently attack this woman. And those folks were apprehended and they were, um, I think, arrested. And I don't know the final outcome of the case. It's a very tragic anecdote to share. And I'm sharing it because I really want to recognize the harmful impacts that this has had on outreach workers. Uh, the outreach worker in question continued through the next 10 days. We did, we worked solid without a day off. They really did stay there um, providing as they're just one of the best people I've ever seen at this work. Um, the collaboration that they embodied, the way that they brought folks together. But that individual is now on leave um, because of the mental distress of this type of work and their inability to continue to navigate. And I, and I raise that up not for us to have um, to just take away a bad feeling, but to recognize how far reaching this crisis really is and that the people who care are being harmed through their care. And soon we're gonna run out of people who do this work and who care. And so I think the takeaway for all of us is that we do need bigger, better, more bold, more sustained, broader solutions to the homelessness in our in our society, in our communities, um, the homeless crisis, because it is having uh, people are harmed, people are desperately sick, they're dying before their time, they are victims of a lot of, of violence, and and so many of our outreach workers are also victims uh, of this violence. Unfortunately, I have too many negative um, anecdotes and stories, and I try not to focus on those, even though they're critical to share. There's quite a few more. There's people that passed away um, through this work, um, through overdoses. Um, all of these things, I think, underscore that this is not something for any of us and our elected officials to take lightly. And I'm grateful that we're moving in that direction, um, but we really do need to see a little bit more. Um, we just need more. Well, thank you for sharing that anecdote, Stephanie. I think it's definitely important for all of us to take into consideration. And we definitely need a much broader policy response to these problems. Um, shifting gear uh, to some more technical questions in the uh, Q&A panel. Uh, this question is from Anna in the audience. Uh, were there any performance measures that were tracked during and after the transition? Yeah, we're building our capacity around this. You can you can tell that we're we're moving quickly a lot, and so performance measures do take some effort. But one of the ways that we do try to measure performance is the percentage of people that remained housed after certain milestones. And thankfully, excuse me, through our efforts in um, 
both Oppenheimer and Strathcona, which moved um, in uh, over 600 people indoors in that um, kind of two events in 2020 and 2021. Um, the majority of those people, and I think the number is somewhere in the 80 percentile, 80 percentage points, somewhere 80 something, have remained housed. We see that as a critical success factor um, of, of doing this work. Um, there's other performance metrics like the costs and stuff like that, but I think we're trying to focus more on the qualitative um, because that's helpful for us to know what is working and what is not working as far as people's experiences go. And so what we are doing is evolving our practices. Um, we're evolving our, 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 our um demographic data collection. We know that the National Homeless Count recently made the quite the race question, race identity question mandatory so that we can actually now understand these populations and connect them in with cultural supports um, and other supports that are being, you know, exemplified in the demographics. And then, um, you know, other areas where we're trying to measure um, our outcomes. We did a, a camper survey in Strathcona. When people moved indoors, we asked them questions about what led to their homelessness, where they were coming from, just to at least get a snapshot um, so that our policy work is framed in ways that are really, you know, evolving into the to the to the needs that are that are present. But we have a way to go, I would say, on on some of the performance metrics. Right now, it's really people that remained housed after, you know, three months, six months, et cetera. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, another question. This is a multi-parter from uh, Ken Chapu in the audience, so bear with me. Um, did you say buy hotels, as in take possession or ownership of the hotels? How does that fit into your corporate mission or operating permissions? Um, I heard you say something about a nonprofit managing one of the hotels. How is this relationship configured and what are the expectations? And finally, what are your exit plans from those hotel investments? So this is a great question. We did a couple of things for the, some of the hotels. We just did bulk leasing. This was right in the middle of the pandemic. These hotel owners were very happy to see us. Um, and so we did some bulk leasing. Where there were acquisition opportunities, we did acquire a number of properties. Um, and that was both in Vancouver and, and in Victoria on the island to um, support people that moved indoors. And those acquisitions were guided by a few factors. Number one, that they were um, a reasonable price to acquire. And number two, that they had long-term redevelopment potential. So those were the decisions. We recently had um, an office of the Auditor General do a review of our hotel purchases. That is a public um, uh, facing report that was issued just a few weeks ago. So if you wanted to dig into some of the details a little bit more about our both hotel leasing and hotel purchase, I think it focused mo mostly on the purchases. You can reference that, that document um, for that. With, like what I mentioned at the beginning, our model is mostly to fund not-for-profit housing operators who do the day-to-day -day management. Um, we could provide the financials and they do the day-to-day. -day. Um, that was true in these circumstances as well. So we provided funding to nonprofits who put their, you know, it was very uh, urgent times. We had only a few operators who would even have the capacity to take this on. But between about three or four different um, operators, we would provide the funding to them and then they would do the, the actual um, operations of the, of the hotel spaces. So that's, that's how that, that operated. And what was the final part of the question? Um, uh, finally, what are your exit plans from those hotel investments? Yeah, so that's part of the permanent housing plan. So where they are bulk leases, um, we have lease extensions in place to make sure people stay housed. And we have a permanent housing plan that is being directed by the province. And then where we acquired those hotels, of course, folks will stay housed there uh, uh, until the near future when we do a larger scale redevelopment, which we don't have funding to do right now. It's not on our immediate um, policy agenda, but those are longer term opportunities. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, next question uh, related to the anecdote that you mentioned earlier. Uh, how have you been able to cope with the staff resourcing requirements related to um, de dealing with these encampments? And did you have to recruit more professionals or outsource those outreach services? 
so far, we've been able to work through our existing partnership with groups like PHS, TIRA, um, and other. Carnegie um, is an, as an organization that's overseen by the city of Vancouver. They do outreach services. So, so far, we've had sufficient kind of um, organizations and people at the table, but I think I'm recognizing that this is definitely a slow, you know, moving um, crisis that's building um, with as far as the ability for people to stay in place, to do the work and to continue in, in good health. Now, a lot of these organizations provide um, outstanding mental health supports for their, um, for their team members and for things like that. But it's absolutely a matter of um, recognizing that this is something we need a, a, an overarching um, strategy for in our sector um, to really support people to recognize this burnout that occurs and, and how we will you know, a, a retain people who are doing this work if it's work that they can cycle in and out of and have other responsibilities that don't have the same impact or other things like that. But it's absolutely one of those those pressing it's I think what we describe as one of the number one um, risk factors facing our sector is the attraction, retention, and positive engagement of people that are working on the front lines. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I think this is a good one to end us off. Um, if you had one piece of advice to give to anyone working with people in encampments, what would it be and why? Mm, one piece of advice. Um, heart forward, ego to the back. Um, you know, we, th those of us that work in this, um, in professional settings that require us to address encampments or do outreach, um, we have to recognize that, like that slide about the systemic, the individual and the structural factors that are impacting people, that this is not personal. So if people are angry, if they're shouting, um, I've been told to F myself in a lot of different ways um, by people that are angry, it's not personal. Um, and so if we have an ego about this, then we will get angry, we will get defensive. I think that's counterproductive to really the support and the help that folks are looking for. And with heart forward, we're going to listen more than we speak. We're going to understand and have compassion um, about the work, the issues that people are facing, and we're going to meet them where they are um, without being imposing, without being institutional and bureaucratic, um, but to really take a human forward approach to that. That would be my best advice, and I think what has served the, all of my colleagues and myself really well. I think it's great advice. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so that's all the time we have for today's webinar. Uh, many thanks from all of us at CHRA to everybody that logged in today and to Stephanie for the amazing presentation. I really learned a lot. I think everybody did too. Um, if everybody enjoyed our session today, which I think you did, you're going to love CHRA's Congress on Housing and Homelessness happening this month from April 25th to 28th. With over two dozen total sessions, amazing speakers and really cool workshops, there's bound to be something for everyone. So take a look at our program. It's available online. Uh, it's really easy to find. It's been sent out multiple times through CHRA's newsletters and through social media. Check it out. Register today. Uh, thank you again, Stephanie. And to everybody, uh, take care and stay safe. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And thanks, Jacob.